Welcome to the Massacre Matinee. Do you think we're all warmed up now? Are we ever actually warmed up? No. We're never prepared <laughs> to start an episode, which is exactly why we're starting this episode like this. Welcome back to the Matinee, Kate. Welcome back. So, it's my turn to do a case. Yeah. And this is going to be a two-parter case, which you would already know if you are following us on Facebook or Instagram, because at noon today, you guys would have got your little preview to the episode. Yeah, that we totally didn't panic while at work to get up. I, I <laughs> forgot to, well, I, I'd been working for the better part of the week on trying to find the graphic I liked for it. Yeah, because that's we true. Use the, we use AI-generated graphics for most of our episode yeah. pictures. We the do like that uncanny valley. Yeah. <laughs> The, the two exceptions to that are your deer stand was used as the picture yes. for the hunting episode, and the Loria Manor Inn is a picture of the Loria Manor Inn. I think Inn. if we do any kind of thing on, like, a real building, they'll probably be about the real... Like, the picture will probably be the building itself. Yeah, for the most part, if yeah. we can... Um, or if, if it's still if it, if it <laughs> suits If it suits the situation. Yeah. That was a lot of S's. Alliteration. Oh, I'm proud of myself for remembering. I'm proud of you too because <laughs> I did not remember it. So today we are blue going bus. to school bus. School <laughs> bus. It's the, it's the blue bus. The blue bus. It's basically a school bus. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was the most ADHD school thing. School bus. Oh, I should goodness. not have you facing the door. <laughs> it's a really warm day considering... It's December. Dude, it's so December my porch is open. Our, our area usually has at least at least four a foot feet and a half. At least almost four feet of snow by this time. Right. And we have not even an inch and it's like almost fifty degrees. Gotta love El Nino. The grass is green. Teddy's like, Oh I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna plow. So then the grass will finally like freeze, so then it's fine for when I plow and I'm like, It's not gonna do what you think it's gonna do. He called it scalping the yard, and I was like, mm. "If he plows, he is in fact going to scalp his yard. You won't have a lawn in the spring." Surprisingly, we still have grass. But I'm amazed that you do, considering how much we always drive on it. I don't really that front yard. I don't care about. I don't really care about the grass. Who needs grass, right? I, I like. Grass. I have a huge ass yard. I like grass. C- cutting the lawn, mowing the lawn, and like doing yard work. Well, not all yard work. Doing some yard work, mostly mowing the lawn, is you like one of my therapies. Well, when like come, pissed, come mow my huge ass lawn. <laughs> when I'm, oh, when, even when I was a kid, when I'm pissed off, I mow my lawn. If I'm having a bad day at work, I'll come home in the summer and mow my lawn, unless it absolutely doesn't need it. But like, if I mowed it yesterday, obviously I'm not going to mow it again. Oh yeah. Which goes to I show something because I did not mow my lawn that much last year, dude. I probably should have like we should have mowed our lawn at least twice before we got that first snow we should work out an arrangement where i come mow your lawn in the summer and teddy comes and plows my driveway in the winter oh i'm sure he'd be down <laughs> he fucking hates mowing the lawn <laughs> but we have a riding lawn mower, so at least there's that oh that one has to get fixed so now that they've heard about our lawn work <laughs> oh don't worry a lot of that fluff's gonna get taken out <laughs> I don't think people realize how long our episodes would be if we kept all the fluff. So today we're going to talk about Daniel William Marsh. Now, in 2008, the name Daniel Marsh probably would have been seen in a lot better of a light. It would Mm -hmm. have been actually associated with a hero in Yolo County, California, which is Mm -hmm. where this happened. Um, When he was only 10 years old, while his dad was driving down the road, his dad experienced a heart attack. And he stopped the car and saved his dad's life with CPR. So he actually had gotten awarded. A lot of people at the time figured that Daniel was going to grow up and do amazing things. And the problem is they were all, like, dead fucking wrong. Like, they couldn't have been more wrong. (laughs) Um, (laughs) He said, hold my fucking beard (laughs) real fast. Right. So, 10 years old, he saves his dad's life. And then shortly after that his family went through a divorce like really Mm -hmm. shortly after he was in the limelight and everything because his mom was in love with his female kindergarten teacher yeah his former kindergarten teacher 
it was that affair and ultimately their resulting divorce that seemed to be the jumping off point for Daniel's mental health problems. He openly admitted that at like 11 years old, he was fantasizing of like slitting that teacher's throat for splitting up his family. And mm-hmm. It's interesting to me that he didn't blame his like he blamed his mom, but he didn't blame his mom as much as he blamed the teacher. Right. Well, I mean, like he put a lot of stuff on the teacher. A lot for of breaking a, up the family. A lot of that, I feel, and keep in mind, we're not clinical psychologists or anything. We say that all the time too. In our opinion, or in my opinion, one of us is going to get a fucking psychology degree at some point. At some point. <laughs> But I feel like the stigma around that is probably more related to they wouldn't have left me if you didn't seduce them. So that's right. where that additional aggression, I feel, comes from. If I'm right, awesome. Like, if I'm wrong, please fucking tell me. That's also a weird level of trust that was broken with him because right. it was someone that he also looked up to because it was his teacher and a kindergarten teacher is like real fucking important. Like, I even remember my kindergarten teacher. I didn't go to kindergarten. I did preschool twice and then did went to kindergarten. How the fuck did you skip kindergarten? I, maybe I did and I don't remember it, but that's the one teacher that I don't remember having. Well, you probably I don't believe I went to kindergarten. I remember first grade through everything else. I remember, th- I, remember the t- <laughs> I remember the teacher's names. I don't remember a whole lot about those times, but I remember well, the teacher's kindergarten names. Kindergarten is like, you have to do kindergarten in order to go to first grade. So you probably did? Maybe things were different. I don't know. I'll ask my mommy. (laughs) Editing Ari here. I did actually go to kindergarten. I talked to my mom about it. And I guess what happened was we had moved two or three times just when I was in kindergarten. So I had switched schools a few times. So I guess that explains why I don't really remember it. By 11, he was seeing a therapist and he was talking to the therapist about having those fantasies and dreams that he was having about killing and torturing people. I didn't realize he saw a therapist. That's fucking even crazier to me that he was getting help. This is why this is one of very few cases where I will give a lot of backstory on the killer is because there were so many opportunities that this could have been prevented. This is a... Is this going to be a case where, like, professionals need more training than, like, what they were given to help people? And they could have, like, if they just would have known how to handle this kid right. in his therapy, that this wouldn't have happened? Right. And oh, my God. <laughs> and, but also, like, people in general. I mean, there was more than just professionals that were, like this is kind of fucked up but didn't say anything it definitely seemed like a lot of people in his life were like "Mm, you're mm." (laughs) yeah buddy (laughs) so the this is one of those professional like what situations so He, after telling his therapist at 11 years old that he was having fantasies and dreams about killing and torturing people, they diagnosed him with, quote, an adjustment disorder with a depressed mood. I mean, I can see it, but like at the same time, if you have a depressed mood. Keep in mind, this is not that long ago. I mean, it's only... Well, it was it was this. 2008 when he saved his dad. So at 11 years old, it, 2009. So by 12 years old, he was actually outright just threatening to beat the shit out of people and hurt people. <laughs> Nobody said anything. Is he 12 years old? That's like... That would have been 2010. Well, grade. He would have been in like 5th, 6th grade. I want to say 5th. Well, depending on when, his, well, if his birthday is early in the in the year, he might actually be in right sixth. His birthday, he's not that important. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so he he is middle middle school, well, middle school, because middle school in right. some places is like fifth grade to fifth to eighth, eighth for me. Yeah. So after outright threatening to beat the shit out of people, and nobody said anything for some reason, or like very little was done, if anything was said. It probably was suspended in school or some shit like right, that, but right. nothing... You need professional help. Well, at 13, 
He was actually prescribed two antidepressants. So now we've gone to three years after helping save his dad's life. Now he's on antidepressants. In that in that situation, they put him on Prozac. I find that relevant because uh, there's just a long list of different ones that he kind of bounced through, and oddly right. enough, they're all very familiar to me because I've also been on all of them. <laughs> it's weird that I have so many of these situations where le- it's like, hey, I can relate to this person, except I don't want to kill people. That's where it's really interesting. I and think I was that's talking with yeah. my mom about it with how mental health is because she was I don't know what we were talking about it was when we were on our way out of town and how I think we were talking about how mental health medicine has come a long way but like really not compared to all of the different things in the medical field that have advanced because every situation is different (laughs) I yeah I think a lot more mental health issues have been identified but yes. the treatment for those things has advanced very little just because mm-hmm. and as weird as it sounds scientific trials on people are difficult yeah cuz uh, because like you said everybody else reacts to it different that's why on on medicine commercials on TV and mm-hmm. on YouTube and stuff like that first of all fucking hilarious that they all start off by saying do not take if you are allergic to this <laughs> But they'll list off so many different side effects, right. and it's like, you know, maybe one out of a hundred people got raging diarrhea. Yeah, if one person has it, they have, they to, have list to list it. it. But I think what's better that they're starting to realize is that they're putting everything on a spectrum mm-hmm. rather than, oh, it's this one definite thing, and like now how anxiety and depression are getting realize they're really linked together. really roped together and then you have um like adhd and autism are really roped together because there's so many things that are similar to where it's just like one little tweak in a chemical in your brain and bam you have schizophrenia versus another little tweak you're just either like bipolar or something because it's all that's all it is it's chemicals in mm. your brain that are in balance and it's so weird how just that little bit of difference you have a completely different fucking disorder. See, you're looking into it way deeper than I am because I guess my <laughs> appeal to true crime is I'm sitting here going, yeah, I took all those medications and I have this problem and that problem. But, but I think my, that's what I it's might what be it. fucked up and my life might be crazy, but it ain't that. But you don't got that chemical. Crazy. <laughs> you don't have that little bit of a different chemical to make it be like, I want to go stab people. <laughs> like, I'd like to I think, think that's what it's I like. would like to think that even with that one little chemical saying, mm-hmm. hey, we should go like stab people, it all comes down to your ability to control yourself. Yes, I think it's also the ability to be like, okay, these are just intrusive thoughts, which everyone gets. Everyone gets those horrible mm-hmm. fucking thoughts where it's just like, you can't what if I punted this kid like in the <laughs> face? <laughs> like, Why did you have to go there? I was going to say, what happens if I drive on the other side of the road? <laughs> <laughs> it's a spectrum. <laughs> It's staying in. Oh, my God. (laughs) But uh, intrusive thoughts are normal. And, like, you got the people that let them just go, eh, eh, that was kind of weird. All right, back to my day. And then you get the ones that obsess with it. it. And they're like, oh, my God, I'm having these thoughts. And, like, they go crazy and they think they're crazy. And then that's the people that end up going, like, I just want to say, once again, we do not have psychology degrees. However, it looks like you're the one that's going to be getting one. However, I have taken multiple classes. You have, (laughs) but that was child psychology. Although I guess it kind of... You had to take, like, actual psychology classes. It kind of compares... It kind of compares a little bit. I mean, I guess he sort of was a child at the time. Well, the one that I wanted to get into was uh, child crime. So, Child crime. Like... Kids that like are involved kid, in crimes that or oh, okay. witnessed crimes and that kind of stuff. Okay. And what was either a cry for help or maybe just a plea for attention, just wanting to be seen. At 13, while on Prozac, Daniel started regularly drinking and smoking weed and bouncing back and forth between living with his mom and living with his dad. Oh, so she, he was getting fucked up he because... Was, he At 13, he was yeah. regularly just wasted and bouncing back, right. back and forth between houses. A lot of things with these medications in case you've never been on them which is completely okay too a lot of the times they're like don't drink well on antidepressants because one drink feels like seven. Yes. 
So. And he was smoking weed on top of that. Oh, my God. By the time he was 14, he w- his dad was just like, don't come back to my house. Get the fuck out. I don't want to <laughs> fucking see you anymore. And somehow That'd his mother so was completely dad. oblivious to him being drunk all the time. And he was 14. She probably wanted to turn a blind eye because she was already like seeing how much of a issue he was having. So she was just like, if I don't acknowledge it, maybe it'll go away. <laughs> but he was regularly visiting doctors and things. Yeah. <laughs> So, like, who's buying it for him? That's a good question. But in late 2011, he was actually hospitalized for a month, both for anorexia, because he had dropped down to 93 pounds at 15 years old. He was high-key too drunk to fucking eat. You'd think the weed would mellow that out, though. <laughs> you would think, but I feel like if you get drunk enough, you're just like... Well, the thing about, the thing about especially... He could have been eating, but not keeping it down because it, of how Well, drunk if you he assume it's possible, but if you assume it's beer... I mean, you drink a beer, you kind of feel full because it's empty calories. If he was wasted the whole time, he definitely was getting bottles of fucking, like, vodka. Oh my god, it was probably UV blue. Oh, (laughs) that would have been the era. (laughs) It was high-key UV blue. It had to have been. (laughs) He was hospitalized both for the anorexia, though, and because he was admitting to a school counselor about his homicidal fantasies. So that was the first person that was like, hey, we need to, like, check this kid out, see what's going on. Like, fucking, some school counselors are a blessing, and some of them are just some of power them are worse. <laughs> some of them are worse than they are good. Yeah. Speaking from experience. During this time between when he started the antidepressants and when he was hospitalized for the anorexia and for mm-hmm. the admitting the homicidal fantasies, his medication switched around a lot. So he was on Celexa at one point. He was Ooh. on Lexapro at one point, on Ew. Zoloft <laughs> at one point, on Seroquel at one point, on Wellbutrin at one point, and on Albilify at one point. Seroquel is an interesting one. Because that's is. an antipsychotic. Yes, same for Albilify. But this, you know what's really fucking weird? They will uh, give people Seroquel for sleep medication, too. Anyways, so doctors at the facility that he was at for that month noticed Mm -hmm. that he frequently had these, like, weird out-of-body experiences, which he actually talked about himself and kind of described it as, like, being in the third person. Well, he was on a fucking slew of medications. Not all at the same time, but the medications he were on were heavy. You said he was on uh, Celexa, right? Yes. I wonder if he also got fucking serotonin syndrome. It's possible. Because because my mom was was on on Celexa and she got that. And he was on the, the Lexapro as well, and the Lexapro is at a the same SSRI. Time? Not at the same time. Okay, I was going to say, if that was at the same time, then, like, yeah, he got fucking serotonin syndrome. Because I remember my mom was talking about having out-of-body experiences when she was having her serotonin syndrome. It's possible, because he had started on the Prozac. I think he went to the Celexia shortly after that. Mm-hmm. So it would have been one of the older ones. It could have amplified the issues he was already having. yeah. We're not psychologists. No. We but are also med- medicines not, we are do also not have pharmacists. effects that have... They literally fucking say it when they're like, oh, may cause suicidal thoughts and all that kind of stuff. So th- there is that weird chance that it makes the problem worse. Mm-hmm. With any medication. <laughs> Especially when it comes to mental health medications. Because like like we were saying you know, a little bit ago, you know, the, it's all just the tiniest little chemical tweak and nobody's got the same exact chemical schematic. Mm-hmm. So you, you really got to find something that works. So following his release from that treatment in early 2013, he ended up going like right back again to a school counselor. And he's like, hey, so I'm having full confidence right now that I could just hurt people. <laughs> the last month just didn't fucking work. Like. Right. <laughs> Uh, the a- exact quote that he actually said was, I have full confidence that I could hurt these people in regards to, like, his classmates. He was just like, I'm going to fucking hit people and, like, murder people and torture people. See, do you think, and I don't like going this route, but do you think if he had the access to, do you think he would have shot at the school rather than doing what he did? No. But why I say no will come up later. Okay, because I was just like, with him saying that he wants to hurt his classmates, he could have easily went down that road, I feel like. I don't think he would have, based on the research that I've done and details that I will get into Mm -hmm. probably in part two of this. Okay. 
based on the research that I've done, I feel like he, as a killer, is much more personal and intimate about his killing and Especially gun violence is too distant in this situation. Yeah, I guess I can see that now just because of exactly what he did. So after he told the the school counselor about his homicidal ideations, they finally were like, hey, we should call the cops about this kid. Yeah. Like get something taken care of. So cops come in, but it was determined that he was of no harm to himself or anyone else. <laughs> So I'm not sure if he talked his way out of it because the thing about this guy is he actually did a TED Talk presentation. <gasps> I know. I wish And you cannot find, find the video I on it. I wish. I fucking I have desperately wish tried. that I could get my hands on that. But he did a TED Talk. So obviously he's a smooth talker. I'd believe anything he talked his way out of it and was like, oh, you know, I was just trying to say that to get attention. I really want to know why they let fucking murderers in prison who are actively in prison do fucking TED Talks. I don't know. What? I really don't know. Cops are like, well, we're not going to do anything. I don't think he's going to hurt anyone or himself because he's such a smooth talker. He probably talked his way out of it, honestly. And his fantasies of wanting to, like, torture people and kill people were just getting bigger and bigger and yeah. worse and worse and more aggressive and... At one point, he actually described in detail how he wanted to torture people by peeling the skin from their hands and cutting off their eyelids. So on more than one occasion, he actually mentioned that these feelings of wanting to torture people were mm -hmm. only like just barely scratching an itch. <laughs> like it was just just the surface. If, he, if the surface if that's of what the he's level, admitting to and he admits that to someone, yeah. that's when you just throw him in a fucking sponge room. <laughs> He, he quoted that it scratched the surface of his deepest urges. Throw him in a fucking room. <laughs> Throw him in a padded room. Right then and With there. With one, one of those jackets that Straight makes jackets. you hug yourself. Yeah. yeah. So after developing an interest in serial killers like Ted Bundy and Jeffrey Dahmer, as well as an interest in gore porn. Have you ever heard of gore porn? I have not. <laughs> so gore porn is not porn like you would expect. Rather, it is the most gruesome and <gasps> oh, gory okay. and horrific videos so just that lively. you can find, <laughs> and it's it'll yeah it'll be stuff of like people dying, people I bet he being played tortured. <gasps> Dude, this kid probably fucking played Reddit fifty fifty. So after getting this interest in the gore porn, he started setting fires and hurting animals, and he had witnesses to some of it's the, animal the fucking stuff. animals. It is why. And hurting these animals included things like strangling a cat to death and a raccoon. Bro, not well, the I don't think trash I don't think panda. It didn't actually say that he strangled the raccoon. It just said that he killed the raccoon. So I'm not sure how he did that. Maybe he just beat the shit out of it with a shovel or something. I mean, I'd imagine it was a wild raccoon. So it probably wasn't being super friendly about it. Like your typical domestic raccoons. animal. <laughs> raccoons are sweet. We used to have some. Well, we didn't they have them. They were wild, but they'd come eat at our house. When my mom was growing up, they had one. And, like, when he started getting too big, they, like, said, no, you got to live outside. And he'd open their screen door and steal a rug. Because mm. <laughs> he was pissed that he couldn't go inside. <laughs> so he actually went so far as to ask a friend of his, which, how the fuck does someone like this have friends? He asked a friend of his if he could kill their dog. Like, would you be mad if I killed your dog? Fuck yeah, I would. I'm sorry. If someone comes up to me and they're like, can I tell can kill your dog? Oh, can you pet my dog? No. Can I kill your dog? I'm no. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Get out. <laughs> right. After the murders, at 16 years old, Daniel William Marsh was tested on the psychopathy scale. It's like a checklist. Yeah. Like, the more things you have checked off about yourself, like, the worse of a person you are. Yeah. So, at 16 years old, he scored a 35.8 out of 40 on that checklist, which outranks Jeffrey Dahmer. It outranks John Wayne Gacy. Didn't Dahmer have, like, a, uh, what was it? One of them had a 24. Dahmer was roughly, I believe, 23... Dahmer and Gacy were both pretty low, like between 23 and 29. I can't remember exactly. Um, mm -hmm. Eileen Warnos was also in that bunch, and I think hers was like a 26. 
So they were all relatively low. Mm-hmm. Like, up there, but still low in comparison. Um, but comparatively, Ted Bundy was actually a 39 out of 40 on that scale. Ooh. Yeah, yeah he was fucking crazy. Mm. At this point, Daniel's 15. Mm-hmm. Let's back up a little bit. Oh, jeez. <laughs> in between 2 and 3 a.m. in the early morning of April 14th, 2013, Daniel went out hunting for a victim to just finally live out these fantasies and complete these urges and just Mm -hmm. be a terrible fucking person because let's be honest that's what you are at that point and after planning every single detail he could think of to be able to hide his identity including wearing gloves to avoid fingerprints and dna and taping the bottom of his shoes so they couldn't get shoe impressions dude he dressed all in black armed himself with a six-inch buck knife, and according to Daniel himself, he checked around 40 or 50 houses for open doors or windows until he found an open window at a condo two doors down from where his father lived. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Hella fucking close. That's what Uh, it was. It was hella fucking close. close. (laughs) Super nearby his dad's house. And after he sliced open the screen with his knife and climbed through the window... He waited in the living room until he heard snoring just so he could make sure that whoever was in the house was asleep because he didn't know. He was just, he literally picked this house. He could have went into a fucking empty house. He he picked this house because the window was open and it was easy to get in. Mm -hmm. And the window that was open, I believe, was off of the living room. Yeah. He climbed through, dressed all in black with his big ass fucking knife. Sits in the living room until he hears snoring, and he kind of follows the sound to the master bedroom. Just mm-hmm. be like, well, let's go see who it is. And he went in there. As he admitted he went in there only expecting one person to be in there, but there wasn't. There was two. Like context clues. There You're was, sitting yeah. in their living room. Context clues. Right. <laughs> like, well, it was dark. <gasps> oh, d- Either way. <laughs> so he followed the sound of the snores to their master bedroom, and he stood at the foot of the bed waiting. And he was... As he described it, he was filled with nervous but excited and exhilarating energy. He was just so raring and ready to go. And he couldn't decide what to do, so he just kind of stood there and just kind of watched him sleep for like 10 minutes. (laughs) It's just, that's the creepiest fucking thing. Because imagine you're watching. My worst absolute fucking nightmare would be to wake up and just see someone standing at the foot of the fucking bed i Mm -hmm. oh my god so he's just standing there at the foot of the bed for 10 minutes so fucking creepy for 10 minutes if it was like if it was like five okay then like maybe he's planning his route but like the 10 minutes was he i wonder what was going through his fucking brain got to get into the brain of some of these people right so just new. Do you feel the? Do you feel the pressure? Do you feel the anticipation? Mm-hmm. Okay, good. That sucks though, because we're not going to talk about the crime on this yeah. case. Or on this, I mean, on the, we're not going to talk about the crime on this part. However, we are going to talk about the victims because this stuff is kind of important. I mean, a big part of this podcast is wanting to give recognition to the mm-hmm. victims over the killers kind of thing i also feel like with how close the dad was he probably knew these people too it's very possible they were very social people Mm -hmm. so the victims in this case are oliver chip also known as chip Mm -hmm. jennings northup jr and his wife claudia moppin we're going to talk about chip first i'm just gonna call him chip for the rest he's of always us. referred to as chip everyone it's knew just, him as yeah. chip it's just it's easier so he was actually born in 1925 which is nuts can you imagine how much of the world not the world but like of time just seeing that much time did he see both world wars what well, did the first world war i'm not, um, I'm not too knowledgeable he on the first was, he was in world war Two. uh world war one would have been over i believe before okay because um, world war one is i i know so much about world war two and world war one just kind of is too old for you not <laughs> too old but it's not like 
World War Two is definitely talked about a lot more than World War One. Yeah, because it's recent history, and even then, it's not that recent anymore. No, and it was also only twenty years after the first one. <laughs> True. <laughs> True. So in in World War Two, he was a Navy man, but after the war, he became a lawyer. Uh, he got schooling both from UCLA and from the UC Berkeley School of Law, and he practiced law up until his death at the hands of Daniel Marsh. Despite being a lawyer by trade, he was actually always passionate about like writing literature and guitar, hmm. which is crazy awesome. He actually, I guess, uh, he still, up until the day he died, was playing with like a small little band just for little stuff. Oh, oh yeah. He was very involved in the church I as well. I remember that's like <laughs> that the band was like a big reason why people thought something was wrong. Mm-hmm. He was actually married three times before he died. Uh, so two marriages before mm-hmm. his marriage to Claudia. Both of his first marriages were actually pretty long lasting and his first marriage ended pretty amicably. I'm not sure about the second one. But it was just, it was a mutual thing for the first one that they split up. And they were actually still, like, regularly I think they were friends. keeping in touch and well, stuff Well, yeah, because like he had um, children with the second one, mm-hmm. didn't he? Yeah. I believe I believe, I believe so. it was the second one that he had kids with. Because it was... He, the the whole family structure, just between the two of them, is a lot. Yeah, toward, that's what it confused me. Towards the end of Chip's me. life, he was actually a well-respected member of the community and mm-hmm. of his church. Um and he actually met Claudia at church. She kind of like saw him I and was like. I love the story of them because I think, um, I don't know if you caught it in the Explore With Us episode, mm-hmm. but the uh, I think it was her daughter talking about it. And how, yeah, it was. Um, she found him in the, oh God, what did she call it? It was like the 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 man order book or something like that and it was literally it was, just like yeah. a, a it was a church pamphlet yeah church like pamphlet with all the, the members church, yeah. <laughs> she's like, it's it was the, the the man book the man book the man catalog the I man catalog yeah and she just saw him and i think she she, she knew him before that but she was just like this one i'm yeah. gonna marry this one <laughs> So, Claudia Maureen Maupin was born in 1936. Unfortunately, you can't actually find as much about Claudia as you can about Chip. Mm -hmm. Um, And actually, a lot of the information that I got on both of them was from their obituaries. Yeah. So, by all accounts, Claudia was very outgoing and optimistic. She was often just found by following the sound of her laughter. Because she was just always so happy, like one of those types. Like, this could not have happened to two of the nicer nicer people. And a lot of people described her as, like, a wonderful hugger and a mom to anybody. Like, mm-hmm. you need support, I got you, babe. Like, a lot of the time it just seemed like she was just trying to live her best life, honestly. Yeah. And just try and make the world more happy. So, Chip and Claudia actually ended up getting married in 1996 after meeting at the church. And Claudia was an assistant to the pastor there. So, like, she kind of was, like, almost... As she was involved in the church physically more. He was involved in the church financially more. Like, he was always making a lot of donations right. to a lot of causes and things. But um, at the time of Chip's death, he was 87. And at the time of Claudia's death, she was 76. Um, Claudia's three children... So, Claudia had three kids. Mm-hmm. And Chip had six children of his own and two stepchildren yeah i think one of the wives passed away yeah the stepchildren were from a previous marriage and he kept in contact with them Mm -hmm. and i think it's because she had passed away yeah he seemed that's what with with the whole explore with us episode that's like where it got really confusing with how they explained the whole family dynamic but it just seemed like even though the marriages ended or something happened, he was just like, you're still my family. <laughs> right. So between Claudia's three kids and Chip's six kids and two stepkids, that meant that 11 children between the two of these people mm-hmm. gave life to their 14 grandchildren and eight great-grandchildren that they got to meet before they died. Mm. And this, just the fact that this whole thing happened to two of the nicest people, like, I really wish I could actually find out more on Chip and Claudia, just because 
like we always right. keep saying, the victims deserve a lot more recognition than if their killers. And you can find so much on Daniel's mm-hmm. history, but like nothing. I feel like if you want to know exactly people. how good these people were, watch the Explore With Us um, episode because he. They do well, talk to the family. Gets that the team family. is very thorough, and mm-hmm. they make leaps and bounds in a way that we cannot make leaps and bounds right. because it might be a little bit awkward if I start calling strangers. And plus, they get lawyers and all that kind of mm. stuff involved. But they were able to do interviews with the family, and it was so nice to be able to hear, like, especially uh, Claudia's daughters talk mm. about her mom and. How upbeat now And it broke my is. heart when they were talking about, like, how when they, like, found out, you know, what had happened to their parents and everything like that. Like, just hearing somebody talk about their first-hand experience with that, like, it's so devastating. Right. So, honestly, this... I mean, ob- obviously, I've said already that it, it is a murder. Mm-hmm. And that Daniel does kill Chip and Claudia. Um, details in part two... But it could not have happened in a worse way to the nicest people, Ugh. and it could not have been. Like, why do the nicest people gruesome. get the most fucking brutal murders? Like, right. it actually makes me so sad. So the question that I'm going to leave everybody with at the end of this one today is, what do you think would have made a difference in Daniel's past that maybe could have helped? I mean, you mentioned. That maybe if he did end up with serotonin syndrome Mm -hmm. after the Celexa, that maybe if maybe if that was the case, they could have done something. Right. Personally, I think if his mom never had an affair, I think that was the that broke his trust and I think the outlook on life. That's actually a really good point. Yeah, because that that was was like a real turning point mm -hmm. for him. And it was such a, a vulnerable time like, in his life. Going from this real high of getting, you're you're being praised, you're being told how much of a hero you are because you saved your father, and like you know, you're thinking, okay, well maybe like mom and dad were having issues, but like I saved him, they're gonna be fine. And then like not even a year or two later, she's off running off with his teacher. Right. That had to be like him thinking he one wasn't enough for her to want to stay and everything right. like that and then to thinking like but i did this and that's not enough so to him going like i helped this person but i still got the shit end of the stick mm-hmm. i'm not gonna fucking do that anymore so i think it was that real high point okay to the absolute fucking lowest in such a small time frame that it just really just fucked with his brain because he could have had these i am one to believe that you are not born to be destined to be a murderer but you may be born with the things that could point you in that direction okay because obviously like your brain can develop things like there's people who didn't have any mental issues when they were younger but then when they're older they develop those that's actually a a really really good point and that makes me think back to the ed kemper stuff in a way Oh, like yeah. if he had been raised nurture in a versus different, nature, like yeah. it is a huge fucking debate, and it's just it's a combination of both. I'm I'm big on nurture is a huge part of why these people do what they do, right. but then you get people like Bundy, who that is just nature. He Rico Suave <laughs> and still killing bitches. Like he had a pretty decent childhood and whatnot, and he became one of the fucking worst ones. So it's a weird balance. It's kind of crazy though. So, quick little preview to the end of the year. We've only got a couple episodes left after this one. Yes. Um, next week's episode is going to be the finishing up for this Daniel Marsh case. Mm-hmm. Um, we're going to talk details about the murder and the trial for that one. Um, and then we have a regularly scheduled case that will be released on Christmas Day. Merry Christmas to you guys. How fucking yeah. convenient. The week after that is actually New Year's Day, and we'll start we'll start fresh with some little changes, just little ones. Do I announce what case is going to be their Christmas present, or is it going to be a surprise? You know, I was listening back to our older episodes earlier today, mm-hmm. and I think that's the case you're talking about. Yeah, it's the one that you mentioned that you were going to do. So why don't we tell the people? So, and it's kind of convenient that's coming out on Christmas Day because Christmas Day is three days before this person gets released from 
prison. Oh. She gets out the 28th. Okay. We're doing fucking Gypsy Rose, people. I have a lot of feelings about the whole Gypsy Rose case. I have followed this case for years and years, like when it first happened mm-hmm. and all this. Because it happened back in 2015. She only did eight years. Super excited for that. It's going to be great. And it's one of those cases where obviously you guys have known because obviously there was that big Hulu series that came out on it. I can't remember the fucking name of it, but it was good. I can't remember the name of it. And I didn't actually get around to watching it yet. So I'm going to let shy. I'm gonna let the details of the Gypsy Rose case surprise me. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff. I know of the Gypsy Rose case. Mm-hmm. And I know that it was a Munchausen case syndrome situation, but I don't know details. I'm curious. So, so thank you for listening. That was the episode on Daniel Marsh. Daniel Marsh. Uh, part two part coming two out next coming out week. Soon. That's going to have yeah. the, the murder and the trial details. Be forewarned for that. It's going to be crazy. Pretty gruesome. I'm going yeah. to go a lot more in detail because I feel like in this particular situation, showing the detail is the only way that I have left to honor the victims because there's just so little about them. Yeah. That we can find. Just mentally be prepared. That's all I can say. Mm. So we will see you next, next week, week for part, part two. two. Ooh, jinx. <laughs> Bye. Bye.